Thank you for joining us from wherever you are. Now, residents along the Medina Dental Stretch launched a campaign to get six footbridges fixed. They screamed, fix footbridges now, and even protested several pedestrian knockdowns. Currently, contractors are working to meet the April 2016 deadline. But along the La Paz stretch of the N1 highway, road users have abandoned the footbridges. Some even crossed right under a footbridge. In 2017, 3,300 pedestrians were knocked down nationwide. This is indeed worrying. Well, I went to La Paz area earlier this morning to monitor and observe how pedestrians were using that particular area of the stretch, and I could tell that many of them have abandoned the footbridge. Over the last few weeks, the topic or the issue of footbridges have been very, very, very topical in terms of discussions across media platforms, especially because of happenings on the Medina Adventure Highway. We know that several lives were lost on that particular stretch as a result of knockdowns. Now we know that government has pumped in some 5 million Ghana cities to ensure that six footbridges on that particular stretch are fixed as soon as possible. President Tekufuado yesterday toured some parts of the highway and inspected work footbridges. But the concern for many people is that the footbridges sometimes are made not to the specific demands of commuters. Some also say they are not uh, disability friendly. So we are here at the pass to monitor or observe whether the footbridges on this stretch are being adequately used by patients who use this stretch every night. And, and I tell you, the, obse the observations we've made are startling. So we are still at La Paz here and it is a very busy stretch as you can see. Vehicles moving at breakneck speed, but we still have many of the pedestrians still crossing when the footbridges are just about 200 meters away. Let me speak to this gentleman who has just crossed. Didn't now try to climb from that side. Eh, station Okay, he says that from where he was coming from, the station was close to uh, the the crossing that he used because the full bridges are a bit far away from here. But me pa show when him say a very dangerous there. Oh, I mean him say dangerous. Especially say a high highway a cast ne is speedy every dangerous, a dangerous but so we cross us Not as still and I'm a chair, say. Baby, I'm station in the one now. Person across by that side there. This one, and here, a chili cacra and some alcohol food overhead. No, and you didn't mind across short ways. I know shortcuts and so be answer on yet good style because as a moment, I exercise cacra men and see if you are by exercise. Eh, you know, correct. But baby, I any I fear you may back and be seeing now. Best I'm not here to us who are bahan and some other cross. So he's just explaining that, you know, when you go to work, you return exhausted and drained, and so you are not willing to make the extra effort to walk all the way to the footbridge to cross the road. That's why they choose the shortcuts. But set when him say a dental situation, no, and saying, uh, a demonstrations be across the hall. Most of the cars are bubble amount for into many footbridges. No, all footbridges. You see, our master say footbridges. No, I buy the five million cities. Actually, most of them are footbridges. No, now, you see, I mean, who say some of you don't use the footbridges because most say any baby are more on the one. And they say, eh, who here say about footbridges? Nibi mo. Oh, eh, who here pa? Now, the other one say, Nipa, into na mo ye sa bridge ne dia mai. Into sa mo ye bridge no na mo di kosi baby kura de. Ana chesa mo anye ye. Into sa mo ye ne ben kakra. Okay. Okay. So you just heard the Bismarck. He says, well, the full bridges are good, only that they have to be sited or situated very close to the crossing so that once they alight from the buses, they are able to immediately access the footbridges and cross. But in the event the footbridges are far away from where they have to cross, then they have to make another journey up until the footbridges to cross. That is where the problem is. But he is advocating that the safer option, of course, is to use the footbridge. I I I I I I I I I I yeah, yeah, 
But I send a man to me and say, me fine, and me fine. I mean, say a bridge for her. So you just heard she was told she was directed to cross from this side because she's just going to see somebody here. Even as the bridge, you know, sits just about 100 meters away from where she is, she tells me that when she's returning, she's going to use the bridge. But as you can see again, even women, you know, with babies strapped behind them, do the dangerous cross on this highway. Look, look at the lady in the picture. She's having a baby behind her back, she's holding her handbag. She has done the first jump, and she's going to run across the road, you know, to wherever she's going. And it appears a very normal phenomenon here. Uh, the people, number of people who are crossing the footbridges are just as many as those who are crossing dangerously on the highway right here. Yes find out from them they do the dangerous journey across the streets. Let me speak to this this gentleman. Uh, so oh, no, no, no. It's like the person I'm waiting for, the person is here, so the person I should pass. Ah. Uh, so me, I don't even know that there's any food food. Oh, you don't know. Are you new in this area? Yeah. Oh, okay. So where you are returning, are you going to use the footbridge? Yes, yes, yes. Because I will. you know that it's very dangerous crossing over the way you did. Yes. All right. All the best. Okay. Let me speak to us. Yeah, now, Okay, me patcho where the entire bahane say foot bridges now. Oh my, you know, you see a man for cross the bridge, you know. See, it's in a hand who say, "Oh, oh, bano, eshi wechi, and now cross the quay, no." Any dangerous in my? Oh, any who mumu di abat. But a dangerous, who admits say? Okay. Okay. She, she's just telling me that, of course, the stretch that she, the, the, she has to cover before using the full bridge is quite a distance, and that's why she decides to use this place when the road is a bit calm. And uh, Yatsin said they be a foot bridge. Food bridge was not bought a amount for to see a buying the million. Hey, yeah, food bridge back up six. But to see now, food bridges they be a yeah, moon you so to see a no, any any food bridge. Oh, yeah, yeah, moon because yeah, yeah, na say yeah, yeah, this is one of the one I say, oh, cross so quite na say we be out there, oh, na open na yo. Me moon the yeah, yeah, moon. Next time, over cross the quay, and over you so bridge. Bridge, okay. Me for happy, me so me that. So you just heard the a nursing mother who, ha, who ha, was finding out from her why she did it. She says the distance between where she had to cross and the footbridge is quite a stretch and that's why she did this. And it is a very normal phenomenon here. As we speak, people are still moving up and down and crossing over. And that appears to be the normal you know, phenomenon right here at La Paz. So that is La Paz, and the situation is not limited to La Paz. Alone. There are many other areas, you know, across the country where pedestrians have abandoned footbridges on those particular highways and are, you know, dangerously crossing the roads. And we will be, you know, launching that campaign to ensure that individuals or pedestrians use the footbridges as a matter of necessity. Meanwhile, Executive Director of the National Road Safety Commission, May Ubri Yeboa, says a cry alone recorded 1,040 pedestrian knockdowns, adding the situation is extremely worrying. The pedestrian uh, uh, activity around La Paz, I mean, it's enormous. To look at the number of people who use the La Paz area mm. every second, mm. it's so, so many people. Have you also considered uh, the, the possibility of an engineering defect? Have you ruled that out or you're looking at that option as well? No, the, the Ministry of Roads and Highways have planned for that area, an interchange at La Paz. Mm. In the long term, that's what they intend doing. But as of now, the, uh, I don't think they've got funding for it. Mm. We, and we therefore, have... we have to manage okay. the situation as of now. Okay, we are, we are in December 2018. Uh -huh. Do we know what the statistics for pedestrian knockdowns this year are so far? Uh, okay, from January to October this year, the whole country, we've had 2,602 pedestrian knockdowns. In Accra alone, we have 1,040. So it's, uh, Accra is almost taking half mm. of it. So this is the statistics uh, for now. Prior to the same period, 
last year is gone down by 5.48 percent. You had the executive director of the National Road Safety Commission, engineer May Ubri Yebua, there revealing some startling statistics of pedestrian knockdowns. Let's still stay uh, on road related stories because 255 people died in road accidents in the Ashanti region between January and November this year alone. Road safety officials fear the trend may continue unless stakeholders join forces to ensure sanity on the roads as Christmas approaches. Nanaya Ojima witnessed the launch of a Christmas road safety activities in Kumasi from where he filed this report. 106 out of 516 pedestrians knocked down by vehicles died over the period. Overall, 658 people suffered injuries in such crashes. The police motor traffic and transportation department says it is stepping up highway patrol and snap checks, especially on the Kumase Accra Road. Officials aim to reduce motor accidents and also ward off criminals ahead of the festive moment. The age old mystery surrounding accidents related to Christmas engaged the attention of stakeholders. The Accident Preventive Squad has taken delivery of two vehicles to augment existing fleet for patrols. DSP Lydia Champon is second in command at the MTTD in Ashanti region. We have a group now called APS, that is Accident Preventive Squad. Previously, we have only one van, but with the help of IGP, we have had two additional ones. We each go out with education, educating the drivers and the pedestrians, because from our records, the knockdowns are very high. So we go to churches more to educate the drivers and parents as well because sometimes it's what for some of the knockdowns where children are as low as four years as five years we ask them where are the parents where are the children going so the APS team are going out educating and are also enforcing the law so that all these things will prevent it the National Road Safety Commission envisaged a surge in accidents if drivers exhibit recklessness at night when most of the accidents occur regional director Samuel Esiama hints on plans to take off extra light mounted on top of trucks. Then during the Christmas, day, because of the Hamatan season, you find a lot of these people using high beam lights, trying to try to drive through the night. The law says the, the high, your light should be below your bumper. So any driver, especially the trailer driver, who put all these lights on top of their vehicle, we have this accident prevention team where we will mount barriers at specific places on our highways in the night. So when you when you get there, you have you see that you have these lights. We we'll ask you to remove them before you continue a journey. Some bus drivers do, and sometimes when they do that, driving at night becomes very dangerous because they, they put all these four lights and the opposing driver cannot see. Whoever they are driving behind you cannot see very well. Meanwhile, the Red Cross Society is set to train selected individuals on proper ways of handling accident victims. Kwame Asante is regional manager. We have in Ashanti region we have two first aid posts, one at Dwas, one at Asankara. And then we intend training um, volunteers on all the communities along the highway. So we train community, we've trained volunteers in Ejoso, we train volunteers in Konongo, we train uh, volunteers in Dwaso, we train volunteers in Asankare. So we we are training the volunteers in the community along the highway. So in case there's accident on their stretch, they can quickly come in and help. Nana Ojima reporting. You're still watching Enjoy News today. Let's move away from the roads related story now. And the regents of Dagbong, Kampa, Kuyana, and Dani Yakubu Abdullahi has denied what he says are suggestions that he failed to show up for mediation talks in the Dagbong chieftaincy dispute. In a letter written to President Tekufado, the regent accuses Asantehene Otunfo Setu II of rather not availing himself for a meeting. The Asantehene recently presented a report on the mediation talks to President Tekufado highlighting some challenges he had had to grapple with. Head of the security desk, Gifty Andropia, joins me with excerpts of that letter. Hello, Gifty. What more does this letter say? Okay, so Kamala, this uh, statement is actually a 17-page document, a very long one, I must say, that uh, lists explanations on various issues as far as the Dagbo issue is concerned, uh, put together by the Kam uh, Kampakuyana. Now, what he says here, which relates directly to the uh, the the what Otun Fawcett to said at the Flagstaff House, at the uh, Jubilee House, when he went to present that report, says, and, and I'm going to read verbatim from the uh, document. It says, the pronouncement of His Majesty Otun Four uh, before Your Excellency on 21st November exposes clearly the untruths in which the decisions of the Mediation Committee of the Eminent Chiefs is based. He goes on to say that their decision entirely 
out of tune with the principles of mediation and with Dagbon customs appear to be aimed at achieving uh, an agenda and he's saying that it should not be adopted by uh, your excellency democratic father of all Ghanaians under the oath you took upon the assumption of office he says that your excellency the autumn for suggestion that I refuse to respond to his invitations is not factual I actually met him twice at Menshia on, on 1st February 2015, Komla, and 18 July 2017, he asked. He says, once at my behest and once at his invitation. A third invitation was sent during the Buyum, uh, which is the fire festival, uh, in September 2018. Um, when, so he, he goes on to say that uh, at, it was inappropriate to leave VND at the time of this festival. And he says through this, through his intermediary, that is through Otun Four's intermediary, uh, he agreed, Otun Four agreed to postpone my visit to a later date. When I followed up later, the first week of October 2018, he indicated that he was traveling to South Africa and would invite me upon his return. I have since not heard from him. I did not also unilaterally get my lawyer to go to him but advised the lawyer to respond favorably to his invitation on a matter before his committee, which strangely is also receiving judicial attention at the instance of persons uh, claiming to be leaders of the Abudu Royal uh, Gate. Finally, and in this uh, final paragraph, he says, the two for further grossly aired when he claimed that a very uncustomary advisory council of elders he put in place could not meet. The council met at least seven times with its last meeting in December 2011. During its lifetime, it discussed and advised me on funerals, land administration, and the customs of Dagbon. Copies of the minutes were sent to the Northern Regional Minister and the Yendi Municipal Assembly, and copies of the minutes of the last two meetings were sent to the Chairman of the Committee of Eminent Chiefs. So this is a response to the part of Otunfo's presentation where he said he failed to show up uh, mm. for that meeting. And come last, I was saying, it's a 17-page document, and it's copied to so many, about 13 different uh, uh, people, uh, including state institutions, including uh, the former president, Jerry John Rawlings, former president, John Kufo, former president, John Dramani Mahama, and of course, the president and some other state organizations. Mm, just for purposes of clarity, did he mm. say in this letter that the reason he did not show up was because of a festival? No, he said that there was supposed to be a meeting between him and, and Otunfo. Otunfo has said that he was traveling, and so he said that he would get back, Otunfo would get back to him after he traveled. He said that he could not returned for that meeting because of that uh, Buyum festival. Uh, uh, festival, which was in September uh, 2018, because it was inappropriate to leave Yendi when that festival was ongoing. Okay, so that's clearly different from his uh, you know, failure to show up at the Jubilee House when they were presenting the report. So he said that the report was presented in a way that made it look like he deliberately did not show up. But that was not the case. The point he's trying to make in this letter, if you, if as I read it to you, Komla, uh, was that he provides dates that he was supposed to have met. met to, to for actually, he said, and I'm quoting directly verbatim. He says, "I actually met him twice at Menshia on 1st February 2015 and 18th July 2017." Once at my behest and once at his invitation. invitation. Mm. And he said, "The third invitation." That is, uh, a third invitation for him to meet Otunfo was supposed to have happened during September. And that was when the Buyum Festival was ongoing. And so he could not, it was inappropriate to leave Yendi. So he could not uh, go, that, uh, go to meet Otunfo. He said okay. when he followed up later, which was in the first week of October, Otunfo indicated that he was traveling to South Africa and that he would be invited upon his return. He says he has not heard from Otunfo since, since. that last co uh, conversation or since that last interaction in October 2018. Before I let you go, since this letter was um, issued, have we had any response from Misha? No, this letter actually just came in this afternoon, just when we we're preparing for uh, the bulletin. So, but it, it, uh, like I said, it's a 17-page document, and it provides explanations on various issues related to the Dagbon chieftaincy crisis. And so, um, this part of the statement re re responds directly to Otunfo's statement at the Jubilee House about his inability to show up. And okay. so, it, it's a. It's a statement from Otunfo, and there has been a response from uh, the Kampakuyana, so that's res directly response to it. All that's right. It. Many thanks to you, Head of our Security Desk, Gifty Andropi. I'm sure in the next few hours there will be some counter response from the Mesha Palace on this particular development. We'll be following that and bring you the latest as and when we have it. But away from that, fishermen in Teshi have vowed 
to hold government to the account of building a landing site in their community. They tell Joy News the absence of a well-equipped facility hampers their efforts to embark on their fishing activities. This comes on the heels of the announcement of Cabinet's approval for the building of new landing sites and harbors across 10 coastal towns in the country. Fisher folks here say they've had enough of a lip service paid them by administrations, some of which predates the Kufu administration. Joy News' Kenneth Awachidako visited Teshi and filed this report. The Sangona Landing Beach in Teshi at the Lejokukukroo Municipal Assembly is a fishing community that overlooks the Atlantic Ocean. It is one of the towns earmarked by government to receive one of the 10 landing sites along the country's coasts. But following the announcement of Cabinet's approval of a $235 million project, I am here to gauge the thoughts of the people at the centre, the fishermen. They say numerous unfulfilled promises have left them hesitant to bask in the possibility of its implementation. John Mate Mama is a fishing net owner. If the government proves it's not mere politicization, we will pave way for the construction to begin. Recently, some officials came to inspect our area for the construction of a rubber factory. That's not our priority. We have recorded many casualties as well. Former President Kufo broke ground for works to begin during his tenure, but that was the end of it. Former Deputy Minister of Fisheries and Aquaculture, Benito Okiti Dua, also promised him, but he eventually left office. We know some monies have been allocated to this, so we are monitoring closely. Another disturbing feature at the Sangona Beach is a filth which has engulfed the enclave. One of the fishermen, Mautala Ai, tells me refuse from the adjoining Sango Lagoon is greatly affecting their catch. He wants government to consider a solution to the new sands through the construction of a new landing site. Anytime it rains, the garbage that enters the sea from the Sango Lagoon is overwhelming. I want them to redirect the route elsewhere to allow us go about our duties. The promises have been too much. We are fed up. The new project, according to Information Minister Kojo Ponkroma, is also aimed at creating and maintaining a hygienic environment for the processing and handling of fish. On my visit to the area, women were seen drying fish on the bare floor to be conveyed later onto the market. According to these fishmongers, inadequate storage facilities leave them with no alternative. <laughs> If this landing site is built here and fitted with proper sheds among other facilities, we will have better ways of preserving our fish. Because of this, we get very little value on the fish we sell. We work for nothing. We need government to get it done. It will make it easier to process fish once it's brought up the hill. It is clear that until actual construction begins, this will be just another colorful and fulfilled manifesto promise to which these fishermen have grown numb. Kenneth Awachidako's report for Joy News. Let's all stay in Accra because the police hospital in Accra is working to stock its almost depleted blood bank as blood used in the treatment of accident victims are not replaced. Authorities at the hospital want to use a donation exercise on Farmers Day tomorrow to get more blood for the health facility. Yes, Dr. The Police Hospital Blood Bank, Doris Hammond, talking about the challenge and how they hope to reverse it. We know that uh, for the Accra Regional Police Command, uh, most of our duties here in Accra, we use the police hospital facility as uh, one of the places where we take victims of all sort of violent crimes. And even when there are accidents, and also we have incidents like 
let's say gas explosion, fire outbreaks, and any form of accident, we send the victim to the police hospital for treatment. And it is sometimes very difficult for us if we see that people lose their lives just because there is no blood to save their lives. And uh, we are thinking about organizing a blood donation exercise where we can stock the police hospital blood bank with enough blood, especially as we approach the Christmas or the end of year. And just in case we have any sort of um, accident, at least we should have enough blood to save the lives of people. This is the Farmer's Day. We are converging on the grounds of um, the National Police Training School and uh, we are donating just Tessano here. Okay. And we, the police officers, are setting the examples. A big challenge in the police hospital, whereby people come, they bring all sorts of cases to the police hospital. That's the first point of contact when there's an accident, or disaster, any form of disaster, they bring the people to the police hospital. And you have no option then to attend to them. So we issue our blood to patients, blood which cannot be replaced, because at times they bring people there, you don't even know their relatives. So you give out the blood and there's no replacement. And as a result of that, the, the blood is, the bank is empty now, almost empty. So we invite the general public to come out in their numbers to come and donate so we can stock our food and have enough blood. And blood will be available anytime there is such vaccine. Because when you have excess blood in your system, there's something we call polycythemia. It's a medical term. Yeah, when you have excess, you have severe headaches and you feel so uncomfortable. You had there a doctor, the police hospital, Dr. Doris Hammond, and earlier you had the public relations officer of the Accra Region Police, DSP, if you are thinking. So watching and join you today. We are going to take a quick break and return with some story about the Trade Union Congress and how hopeful they are about, you know, getting, uh, you know, some of the, you know, tax incentives for their members right after business. You welcome back to News Today. Now, residents of Obwasi Ahmiyankwanta are protesting deplorable roads in the town. The residents say they have had enough of their promises and are calling on government to fix the roads immediately. Most of the residents clad in red armbands and headbands hit the streets earlier today. And they are essentially saying that until they get their roads fixed, they are not going to relent. Here are some sites from that particular protest. We'll be bringing you the latest on that particular protest. We understand that the residents are going to be presenting a petition. As and when we have the latest, we'll bring that to you right here on Joy News. Now, if you have large acre farms and monitoring and application of farming methods is your nightmare, hear this. With the introduction of locally built drones, you will be able to map out your farm, detect crop diseases, and do real-time monitoring of crop growth. That's not all. For those in the oil and gas sector, inspecting pipelines and other installations just got a rapid boost with these drones. For Tech Thursday today, we highlight the drone technology and how it could make life easier for many sector players. Perfect. And now the weather. Built in two frames, one in the mold of an airplane and the other a tent-like make, the drones, according to manufacturers SKT Aero Shutter, can simplify work in various fields. Drone technology is quite new. We have a unique opportunity here where drone technology just came and we can take advantage of it. We want to make sure that more of the youth get engrossed in this technology, which can transform the continent. In an open field of the Achimota School, engineers are test flying the drones. Two people operate the monitor and another two observe the readings on a device. Another set is gauging the humidity and temperature levels. And not far from where I stand, an erect pole has a red sack which shows the direction of the wind. All these are in preparation for the drones to fly. I'll show you more. Before long, the drones are set in motion and with a little push, they fly high in the sky. Hey. 
These drones, according to manufacturers, have multiple purposes. In agriculture, large swathes of farm fields can be monitored. Crop diseases can be detected through the use of a drones with specially fitted devices and cameras. Managing Director of SKT Aero Shutter, Derek Anand says the technology is built to enhance the work of farmers and improve yield. To do large agriculture, let's say 10,000, 5,000 acres, it's very, very difficult to actually it's very, very difficult to actually um, track the progress or you maybe you want to see a problem at a particular sector. Right, as you may have 5,000 acres, you have to walk through the whole place to then identify a problem sector. But with the drones, can easily deploy the drone and then it will go there to show that this is where the problem is. Agri extension officers can also deploy the drone technology to map farm fields and carry out monitoring and inspection. You can you can actually map maybe 10,000 acres within a week, whereas in the past it would take it three or four months to map 10,000 acres because you have to do it manually. That's our Tech Thursday story, and that wraps it for us here on Joy News today. More news on myjoyonline.com. For myself and the rest of the team, we say have a good afternoon. But coming up shortly is the marketplace with Emmanuel Abuajiwafi. Thank you for watching.